Chilean squash. It will take about one and a half hours to prepare and will make four to six servings. The ingredients that you will need are four cups cooked squash or pumpkin mashed or pureed, one cup chopped onion, one and a half cups chopped mixed red and green peppers. You'll also need two to three large cloves of crushed garlic and one tablespoon, excuse me, one teaspoon ground cumin. Although a tablespoon for good measure never hurts. Four beaten eggs, two cups corn, fresh or frozen, one half teaspoon of chili powder, one cup grated cheddar cheese, one half teaspoon ground coriander, a dash of cayenne, more to taste, a dash of black pepper, and one teaspoon of salt, two tablespoons of olive oil. First, saute the onions, garlic, and spices in olive oil until onions and garlic are translucent. Add the peppers and salt. Cover and cook for five to eight minutes. <laughs> then add saute to mashed squash, along with corn and beaten eggs. Mix well. Taste to correct the seasonings. Spread into a buttered two-quart casserole and top with cheese. Cook for three in a 350 degree oven, 20 minutes covered and 15 minutes uncovered. And that is how you make Chilean squash. That is a recipe from the Moosewood Cookbook by Molly Katzen. Thanks for listening again. You are tuned in to Tea Time with Cassius. This show is only called Tea Time when I have a cup of tea. And I'm your host, Cassius King. I'm the producer of this show, and the things that you will hear over the next period of time represent the views and opinions of this show and the people making them. All opinions and quotations in no way represent Riverwest Radio and are the sole responsibility of the producer, guests, and callers. Riverwest Radio is not liable for any legal issues arising from the content of this program. Thanks again, and we hope you enjoy what you hear. Drop wisdom, abandon cleverness, and the people will be benefited a hundredfold. Drop humanity, abandon justice, 
and the people will return to their natural affections. Drop shrewdness, abandon sharpness, and robbers and thieves will cease to be. These three are the crisscross of Tao and are not sufficient in themselves. Therefore, they should be subordinated to a higher principle. See the symbol and embrace the primal. Diminish the self and curb the desires. That was chapter 19 from the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu, translated by John C. H. Wu. And now a reading from Lao Tzu, My Words Are Very Easy to Understand, Lectures on the Tao Te Ching by Manjang Cheng, translated from the Chinese by Tam C. Gibbs. Chapter 19, Divorce Wisdom and Abandon Intelligence, and the People Will Benefit a Hundredfold. Divorce humanism and abandon justice, and the people will return to filial piety and parental affection. Divorce shrewdness and abandon selfishness, and there will be no thieves. 
I believe these three statements show that words are inadequate. The people should be made to adhere to these principles, look to the origins, and maintain purity. Diminish self and curb desires. Now the associated lecture to this chapter is, what is described as divorce wisdom, humanism, shrewdness, abandoned intelligence, justice, selfishness, and thereby benefit a hundredfold, return to filial piety and parental affection, and there will be no thieves. All points to the idea that a sage who can put his wisdom to work is acting. Lao Tzu wants to keep the people ignorant. The ancients, who were most adept at ruling, did not try to enlighten the people, but gradually made them stupid. Chapter 38 says, if Tao is lost, Tay appears. If Tay is lost, humanism appears. If humanism is lost, justice appears. Chapter 49 says, The sage's mind merges with the world. The sage treats everyone as his children. These are all descriptions of Lao Tzu's sage. Moreover, the three sentences, divorce wisdom, humanism, shrewdness, are the words of Lao Tzu alone, and before him never found clear expression. Therefore, the text says words are inadequate. Note, dragon-like Lao Tzu's essays and thoughts were revolutionary, easily surpassing what had gone before. However, he says, Look to the origins and maintain purity. Diminish the self and curb desires. That being so, then of what use are the words the people will benefit a hundredfold? Furthermore, if man discards humanism and justice, which Confuci Confucius says are basic tenets of the Tao of mankind, why hope for a return to parental affection and filial piety? Some indulge in imaginative speculation over such issues, but I feel they are superfluous. And again, that was a reading from Lao Tzu, My Words Are Very Easy to Understand, Lectures on the Tao Te Ching by Cheng Manjian, translated from the Chinese by Tam C. Gibbs. Now continuing with our reading from the Foucault Reader, edited by Paul Rabinow, from the chapter, Right of Death and Power Over Life. We last left off with, Sade and the first eugenists, eugenicists, were contemporary with this tr transition from sanguinity to sexuality. But whereas the first dreams of the perfecting of the species inclined the whole problem toward an extremely exacting administration of sex, the art of determining good marriages, of inducing the desired fertilities, of ensuring the health and longevity of children, and while the new concept of race tended to obliterate their aristocratic particularities of blood, retaining only the controllable affects of sex. Sade carried the exhaustive analysis of sex over into the me mechanisms of the old power of sovereignty, and endowed it with the ancient but fully maintained prestige of blood. The latter flo flowed through the whole dimension of pleasure, the blood of torture and absolute power, the blood of the caste, which was respected in itself and which nonetheless was made to flow in the major rituals of parricide and incest, the blood of the people, which was shed unservedly since the sort that flowed in its veins was not even deserving of a name. In Sade, sex is without any norm or intrinsic rule that might be formulated from its own nature, but it is subject to the unrestricted law of a power which itself knows no other law but its own. 
If by chance it is at time forced to accept the order of progressions carefully disciplined into successive days, this exercise carries it to a point where it is no longer anything but a unique and a naked sovereignty. An unlimited right of all powerful monstrosity. While it is true that the an analytics of sexuality and the symp symbolics of blood were grounded at first in two very distinct regimes of power, in actual fact, the passage from one to the other did not come about, any more than did these powers themselves, without overlapping, interactions and echoes. In different ways, the preoccupation with blood and the law has for nearly two centuries haunted the administration of sexuality. Two of these interferences are noteworthy, the one for its historical importance, the other for the problem it poses. Beginning in the second half of the 19th century, the thematic of blood was sometimes called on to lend its entire historical weight toward revitalizing the type of political power that was exercised through the devices of sexuality. <laughs> Racism took shape at this point. Racism in its modern biologizing statistic form. It was then that a whole politics of settlement, family, marriage, education, social hierarchization, and poverty, excuse me, property, accompanied by a long series of permanent interventions at the level of the body, conduct, health, and everyday life, received their color and their justification from the mythical concern with protecting the purity of the blood and ensuring the triumph of the race. Nazism was doubtless the most cunning and most naive, and the former because of the latter, combination of the fantasies of blood and the paroxysms of a disciplinary power. A eugenic ordering society with all of the impl that implied in the way of extension and intensification of micropowers in the guise of an unrestricted state control was accompanied by the Oneric exaltation of a superior blood. The latter implied both the systematic genocide of others and the risk of exposing oneself to a total sacrifice. It is an irony of history that the Hitlerite politics of sex remained an insignificant practice while the blood myth was transformed into the greatest bloodbath in recent memory. At the opposite extreme, starting from this same end of the 19th century, we can trace the theoretical effort to reinscribe the thematic of sexuality in the system of law, the symbolic order and sovereignty. It is to the political credit of psychoanalysis analysis, or at least of what was most coherent in it, that is regarded with suspicion and this from an, its inception, that is, from the moment it broke away from the neuropsychiatry of degenerescence, the irre irrevocably proliferating aspects which might be contained in these power mechanisms aimed at controlling and administering the everyday life of sexuality, whence the Freudian endeavor, out of reaction, no doubt, to the great surge of racism that was contemporary with it. To ground sexuality in the law, the law of alliance, tabooed consanguinit, consanguinity, and the sovereign father, in short, to surround desire with all the trappings of the old order of power. It was owing to this psychoanalysis psychoanalysis was in the main with a few exceptions in theoretical and practical opposition to fascism. But this position of psychoanalysis was tied to a specific historical conjuncture and yet to 
conceive the category of the sexual in terms. Of the law, death, blood, and sovereignty, whatever the reference to said and betail, and however one might gauge their subversive influence, is in the last analysis a historical retroversion. We must conceptualize the deployment of sexuality on the basis of the techniques of power that are contemporary with it. And that concludes the reading of Right of Death and Power Over Life from the Foucault Reader, edited by Paul Rabineau. Tune in next week for continuations of Behold a Pale Horse by William Milton Cooper and other readings. Thanks for listening, and we hope you enjoyed.
Cheese. <laughs> 